travelers and welcome to the versus stars podcast how my loyal listeners thank you for your continued support and remember click the subscribe button everybody this is a fantastic episode because stephen barden and frederick weedman board the mothership they're the composers for the third season of star trek picard come aboard as we go traversing the stars hello mr weedman mr barden thank you so much for coming to the versus stars podcast oh thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us yeah it's, it's an absolute honor. Star Trek Picard is so fantastic. So it's a big deal talking to you both. So thank you for coming on. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, 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 we're super proud of it. So we're, we, we love talking about it as well. I, 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 everything I'm hearing about it, and as someone who's actually seen it as well, that this has been such a widely loved series, even for Star Trek, which sometimes the fans can get kind of pissy about things here. It isn't exactly you know their thing. But um, my understanding is that this has only been when the highest rated star trek series ever as far as uh streaming but as far as critic scores and also fan scores extremely high that must be feeling pretty damn good right now it's yeah so i mean yeah and so it's, it's one of those ones i mean i think when we when we first set out to make it we knew it was the the, the, the real job here was to stick not only a landing from 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 just recent I mean, it was really a 30, a 30, I think it's far as 35 years, 36 year landing now. Um, oh. And, and, but, but they're even wider than that. You know, we were new, we were, were bringing in things from DS9 and from Voyager and, and from beyond. And so, you know, the responsibility there is, 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 is immense. But I mean, the, I think the thing that's we, we had very much going on for us from the outset is that if there's one thing Terry Metalis can do is stick a landing. Um, hmm. And he's, you know, someone who's, you know, not every writer is, not many writers, I don't think, have, have, have the, the sort of the gift for writing an ending that he does. Uh, and so, and, you know, that, that sort of inevitable feeling that you're heading somewhere uh, is very much was very much part of part of this from the outset so so you know once when you have that guidance i think that that that, that really helps uh uh because because i mean otherwise we're just looking at it going uh i mean my, my overriding thing is like don't fuck it up don't fuck it up don't fuck it up, don't, <laughs> don't fuck it up. Uh, yeah. so. i had this uh i mean for me i came in halfway through the process you know Stephen had months leading up to the first note on episode one where he went to the set and he sort of got, you know, had conversations with Terry early on. I was kind of jumping in right in the middle and it was just go time. So I I really didn't have much of a brain space or emotional like space to, to process the amazingness of what's happening in this moment in my career and with what I was doing. So for me, all these feelings of gratitude and this the sense of accomplishment came way after everything was done because it was such a crazy schedule you know, going through uh, the orchestra, orchestral recordings every other week on these massive scores for every episode that I was just kind of in the zone. And then once everything was said and done, I was watching everything back, starting from episode one. And I was like, wow, this is truly an amazing show. Wow, what a cool, what a treat to be part of it. So it took me a while to get to that point because it was such an intense beginning for me. Now, the, the thing I, I kind of hinted on with Star Trek is that the fans will let you know what they like. They'll let you know what they don't like. Yep. How much pressure is it to dive your feet into the Star Trek franchise? Like I said, it's 57 years of TV. It's going to last hundreds of years after this as well. Your People are going to remember what you do. How does that, is that too much pressure or, or did you feel that's my groove? I think it's one of those ones where, I mean, it, it's all about, it's all, I, you know, the word I always use is ethos and it's like, the 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 provided one that approaches it with the uh, it's not so much about sort of saying we're right we're going to come in and write like Star Trek music and do sort of pastiche of like what's gone before, but with that said, it's like we're also not going to throw out any of, of that notion. And, and what I think what so much of this season was about was 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 looking back to all of these things and saying and and not just sort of looking at back what 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 they were, but what were the precursors to those things, mm. um, and and why they did certain things. And obviously, Star Trek is unique in the sense where we're working on sort of essentially sort of you know the continuation of like next generation stuff. 
that it had a precursor, a natural precursor that was part of the same franchise. Whereas mo most other things, you know, for example, you know, when I've been working on Star Wars with Gordy Herb, the thing we we don't really look, you know, we what we look there is 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 the sort of the precursors which are from completely different things, as you know, things like you know Kurosawa and Seven Samurai, or looking at two um, uh, uh, Saturday morning sort of cartoons and the sort of you know the things that were inspiring mm -hmm. both to, you know both to George Lucas and to John Williams. Whereas whereas here you have the natural precursor which is also star trek right. so i mean that and that was a very big thing that terry wanted to look back to to say like look like you know what and and, and we're, we're, we're not just playing in a sand pit of the next generation the next generation's main theme is the main theme from the motion picture and you're know, like yes. so so it was very much this thing of saying what does all of this mean and you can't sort of view any of these things in isolation and and it's it's fun now that you know i think there was the first episode i had people going oh it's fantastic they brought back first contact and then there was equal number of people going why the hell are they playing the first contact there's no first contact there's like zeph from cochran's not not in the show what, what are they doing they don't know what they're doing they don't know what they're doing. and now obviously now i'm seeing people online going oh i get it that was a clue <laughs> and we're like yes it was was also that we stood back and we were like that tune for us is is the nostalgia for space flight theme and i was like i was go back to the the nicest use of it in in first contact for me is the moment where lily you know pointing the phaser at picard and then he opens mm. the space lock doors and you see earth from space and a very subtle version of that tune plays that's very and it's very much about the legacy about the mm. legacy that he's showing the legacy of what this, this thing that he's part of has created the ability to see this and so you know when when we view l cars the same way we see the l cars display and we're like this means so much and for me you know like going on set the coolest thing was to be able to especially you know with the the enterprise d set was to walk on and be like i can press things it's <laughs> like it works i mean this stuff works and it's like it's so you know it doesn't make any sound but other than that it's uh it's really cool it's a really cool thing well to go to your question about the pressure of um you know the fans i think i felt immense pressure because i'm i'm on twitter quite a lot reading also about all sorts of things that i'm involved with and Man, fans are the consensus is always either you do too much of the old and it's it's it feels like you're repeating yourself and they're not happy, and then you're taking things to a new place, musically speaking, is in particular, and then it's then they're asking, well, where is the old theme? Where is this? Where is the old this? It's too new. We don't know. It doesn't feel like Star Trek. Doesn't feel like Star Wars. There's all that, you know. So you, there is a very thin middle ground right in the middle where you kind of have to navigate where you you, mm. you 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 give the fans what they what they want from their you know with their nostalgia of the show and the franchise while also kind of updating everything a little bit and making sure it's it feels current and with the current film aesthetics that we have and, so, and yeah. i mean not only are you dealing with the nostalgia of not star trek next generation but this is the third season of Picard, and Jeff Russo, friend of the show, did the first two seasons. And I think he supervised, was under supervising composer of this one. So how did that all work out where not only are you dealing with nostalgia of next generation, but two seasons before, you have another composer you're also kind of working with or kind of working um, alongside? How did that all kind of mm -hmm. function towards the music and the end product? Well, to be honest, that was mostly a contractual thing. Um, uh, I mean, the thing with this, we, we were... We were very much at the very big outset. Terry had said, like, look, here's the thing we wanted to do. And we'd sort of chatted about it through the last season of 12 Monkeys. And, you know, and it and it, it, it is a departure. It's uh it's it's something that was was a new thing. And you know, look, I'm you know, massive fan of Jeff so he's he's a super composer and he you know, I particularly think he did an awesome job on Fargo though, especially. That was the one that the show that like really alerted me to him as a composer. So yeah. But um, but yeah, that was that was he he wasn't really involved in quite that sense so um much more sort of you know i think i think as a as a as a sort of precursor of uh, and sort of you know kind of set setting the sort of the 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 the, the, the tee up for for to be able to really make this season because i think this is one of those things where i think it took it took it took it, i i think if you come in to try and make this kind of show for season one of picard it might not have happened mm. um and that's just you know the, i think the honest truth is like i don't know that 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 that, that it's one of those things that would have necessarily sort of got gotten green light greenlit in the very strange world that is tv it's very very nebulous and very hard to predict world so um 
but we, we you know we very much worked 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 sort of on on, on our lonesome on that sense so so that was um you know uh and and it was you know jeff came in and very kindly conducted on a on a on a little edit of a couple of jerry goldsmith things that we have on the main title card which was you know a nice sort of special moment but um but otherwise it's, it's just it's the two of us really so so when you started composing the episodes how far in ahead of the episode had you watched before you started composing did they just give you the first episode at a time did they give you the whole series great question um so i on the beginning i'd seen i i'd seen through episode two once i'd seen episode one but they were still editing episode three so it was a very very fast um post-production so they i mean they were shooting right off the back of season two pretty much i mean they literally turned the lights out on season two and the following morning started shooting season three which is insane um and very much the post-production was kind of like the same thing it was sort of like right finished great fantastic wrap next <laughs> um you know so uh, which was normally on a show be fine i mean that's like usually you can do that fine but that was the thing is like these are just two really different animals in terms of the the scope and the the, the certainly the music because uh because you know this this essentially sort of starts off as a, and you know there wasn't always an idea that this could be sort of feel somewhat standalone as a as a, as a season in the sense mm -hmm. of like what it's trying to accomplish isn't so much sort of putting a dot on the end of season three season one and two of Picard and then being like cool and by the way it like does some nice things for tng it very much was a step back look at the whole picture mm -hmm. and say like we may never get to do this again what do we want to do what do we really want to do like actually what does what what's what would be our absolute dream thing and i think that was the great thing is that we had terry metallis on it because you have to have someone with the the, the sort of the the vision that's so clearly expressed um, and and you, usually in TV, especially, it's like it's it's never it's never that that someone has a bad idea and then there's arguments over it or something. It's usually just about how well the showrunner can articulate what they want and articulate their vision for the for the season or for what you're trying to achieve. Because if there's a clear vision, usually most people will be like, "Great, fantastic, we'll do that." And you know, if it's fantastic and successful, marvelous. And if if it isn't, I go down with it and whatever. I mean, it's that's but that's but the, the ones where it doesn't quite work out and it turns into a sort of oh, changing ideas is when you have that that absence of that and so i think that was the what we were really had going for us was he just he knew exactly what he wanted to do from day one minute one yeah i came in a you know more than halfway through the process i think stephen was on episode six when they brought me on to to, to score seven so i frantically watched one through six that was you know i think six was even just the well, we weren't the quite done music. i think yeah yeah so i but i got you know it was like when I got the call, it was it was I had to start immediately that day. So I I just hung up the phone and started watching Sorry Star Trek it. season three. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun. And then uh, you know, by the time I get to my I got to my first episode, I was I had seen up everything up until then. But then I went basically episode to episode. I didn't see anything beyond what I was currently working on. So I was very much in the position of the audience, really, <laughs> which may be a good thing. And that was, I mean, that was also the really interesting thing, which was the, you know, when Freddie came on and like kind of like basically saved saved us was was we got to a point where we had, you know, you know, most TV shows, what you end up doing is you score like two or three episodes, and then you the music editors move in and are able to sort of cover a lot of ground. Um, and you know, most shows have a lot of reused cues, a lot of bits you can, you know, something, and they, you know, they've done card season one and season two that's no bad thing it's normal that's what happens mm. but at the very outset with this one we were like what if what if we didn't do that what <laughs> if we literally tried to score every damn minute of this thing and you know when you add up the runtime of the whole show it's like 500 mm. something minutes of television and you're like that unfortunately means uh that's 400 minutes of music mm. given you're going to like also that it track tends to be you know quite have quite heavy on the music side of things so so suddenly we're like oh hang on a minute that's and we get to about episode six and i've literally been like going for like three months uh straight without a single day off probably working 4 a.m till 11 p.m every day and i'm just just dead I'm literally just dead and like uh, and it became to a point where we were like we we're just either going to have to sacrifice this we've either we either we're insane and you know and because obviously you have a post production schedule that the studio want you to hit and it's not it's not that they don't care but they 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 have a a bottom line they have to look after and they you know it's like money doesn't grow on trees especially in post production and so so 
we it was either that it was basically sacrifice the vision and cut lots of stuff around or could we find someone who could come in and help us get this you know climb this mountain and 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 mostly true true nichols brought up that he said like well let's look at episode seven and it pulls up and literally it's temp wall, wall to wall tent with freddie's music and so we were like I wonder if he's free. And Terry, Terry literally was like on the back of the sofa. He's like, I'm emailing now. I'm emailing him now. <laughs> yeah. And ironically, that email went into my spam and I didn't even see it. And then oh, week, no. I know I, I was horrified when I found out about this. And a week later, <laughs> they finally reached out to my agency and then they called me. But um, when I when I saw I missed Terry, Terry's email, I was like, how can, <laughs> how did I miss that? Oh my God. You know, pivotal moment in my career and it just ends up in the junk. <laughs> Stupid algorithms. How, how uh, after that moment you found out that Terry's email got stuck in spam, yeah. did you check, go through the rest of your spam to figure out who else you might have missed? Yeah, well, ironically, <laughs> ironically, the same thing happened with the director of a little Australian sci-fi film who reached out to me for the same, via yeah, the same way through my, my website <laughs> of all places. And that's the score that was used in the temp for Star Trek. So it's very ironic oh. that that all kind of <laughs> book ended itself. <laughs> bad email hey, situation. It works. It works. I have, so. I have hence removed the contact form from my website, and I'm, I, you know, I just take that out of the equation. If people want to find me, they, I'm, I'm very much available. So hopefully that won't happen again. So there's the, what on um, the question about scoring, right? Once again, because you have a ten episode season you had to feel the musically you need musical continuity throughout the 10 seasons but at the same time you either don't have the full season or you run the risk of giving away musical spoilers based on what could occur so how do you walk that line between making sure continuity stays consistent but also don't give away the game or i see the smart fans are going to be like oh yeah it's very it, simple, it, really. It, I think it's the bottom line is do what Terry says because he yeah, has it all that, mapped out to the smallest detail. I mean, so, that's that's we we had like he is like musically sort of like kind of savant kind of side of things. So, I mean, you literally, <laughs> I kid you not. Well, two things. One is you could play him any cue from the, any episode and he will immediately tell you what cue it is and where it appears in the episode and what it underscores and whether it's the first version or whether three versions ago he had a thing where he was like oh you know he i mean literally like like and he'll do that not only for picard he'll do that for happily for 12 monkeys he literally all four seasons of 12 monkeys he could tell you where every note comes from um and it's just he's uh and then the other funny one is like you know people you know I've, I've told this to a few other composers who literally almost don't believe us so so we got like an email very late one night uh from from lakeshore that was sort of 10 o'clock night saying hey you know we want to get the um the soundtrack cut together so you know do a day and date release and for with the fun you know well, we were still debating i think the exact release date for the soundtrack because of spoilers um and <laughs> and literally the follow i don't think either either freddie or we didn't reply we didn't have time to get to, yeah, to i didn't to, either and 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 the following morning on our email before i woke up and there's there's an email from terry saying i've had some thoughts about the soundtrack what he'd actually done is he cut the entire soundtrack he'd literally made every selection gone through the entire <laughs> score he must have spent all bloody night doing it it was unbelievable um and that is the soundtrack verbatim we didn't change a single thing like not titles not anything it's just literally that is the album as he cut it and it's uh and it's and i just listened through it, it was like this is insanely good like it like this is the best best, best it's all the best bits and it was like this to segue to that to this to that and I, I, a ridiculous kind of thing and I, I defy any other showrunner to do that in a night <laughs> um, or, or to even care that much. Care I mean, that's, much, the yeah. that's the degree to which I would say, like, you know, I'd like we, you know, we kind of express to people and lots of people go like, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, of course, the showrunner director cares about the movie. It's fine, whatever. And, we'll get, and, you know, I try to convey to people, I'm like, no, 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 no. This guy really cares. Like this guy, this is like his, his, his shows that he makes are his, his, children they're his babies they they um you know he 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 really cares um and that's that's the, i think what comes out in space throughout the season is that just it's made by someone with great reverence for the source material uh and who who really is invested in it emotionally so and that's i think at the end of the day it's all you know that's the first ingredient to something great it's like if, if you have someone at the head of it with an incredibly clear vision who knows like knows how to have that sort of level of investment in what they're doing. Yeah. Hmm. Now, if I saw correctly, because was it obviously the album uh, 
to Picard season three is not out yet. But did I see correctly? There's like 50 tracks or something, something along those lines. Like that? <laughs> I'd have to pull it up. That's the beautiful check, thing but... about digital soundtracks. You know, you can you can just kind of make your best off. You don't have to worry about 74 minutes. <laughs> I think it's it's about two and a half hours, and I just actually for amusement wanted to check how many tracks is it. It is 45. 45. So I was pretty close, pretty close to what, what I saw. My God, <laughs> you guys were definitely busy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's about that's the, the, the music that's on there is, I would say, it's less than half of what's in the show. I was going to say, um, there's a whole second soundtrack in there somewhere. We'd have to. Yeah. I mean, it's, we did, we did cull pretty heavily, but I mean, it, soundtracks are tricky because you always want to make it a listening experience that makes a degree of sense as a, as a listening experience. And that, with that, we culled down to about two and a half hours out of, I think, a total of just under seven that we recorded. So it's around seven hours. So give or take some alternate versions and things. So, so is there a Bacard season three B side coming? maybe <laughs> i mean it both in terms of like as a show or in terms of yeah i mean both i mean i think the music there's, exists there's, there's the, the music exists certainly and the uh i think the i mean and as a, a b-side to like what we would what would happen next i you know i think i think there's a huge appetite for us to like carry on with the stuff um and uh, in terms of what form that takes i don't know uh it's something that's very much i think being discussed but obviously we're at a we're at an interesting time with star trek i think and you know obviously with um discovery coming to an end and 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 sort of you know it's it's it'd be interesting to see where it goes and i think as a fan of the franchise generally i'm just intrigued to see what what happens next i mean i love the i love the work nami's doing um and chris westlake on um uh, on on lower decks. decks and um uh you know i think those there's there's lots of sort of interesting new stuff coming in uh and new new voices to it and, and you know maybe maybe it, I, it, maybe it'll be the you know i mean terry's definitely got like two or three ideas in terms of what he would like to do and you know the uh, the star trek legacy idea um and 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 obviously once 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 you see 10 more will become clear i think that will that will that will definitely you know i think people's people's will see the point uh and there's there's a there's there's something there but um whether they whether they allow us to make it or not is a, it, a very nebulous question <laughs> uh, as someone who's listening to exactly what you said it sounds like you and terry just had some conversation about this and you may have some information about this future is there something you just want to you know because no one else is listening if you just might want to accidentally drop uh, I can edit it later, of course. Well, firstly, you know, I mean, <laughs> nah, I mean, you know, Terry, Terry's very honest. I mean, in the sense, you know, he's said online openly that no, nothing is currently, there's nothing currently there, there yet. But, um, you know, hope, hopefully, I, I, th I think a lot of it is waiting and seeing how, you know, I mean, obviously it was very, very gratifying that it, this made the... Um, it made the the top ten streaming list for which is a big deal because that that's never had never happened for the track show before. So, uh, and 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 that was with episode four. So so I'm hoping that you know nine and ten may tip into that scale and you know and if ultimately if something hits into the top five streaming of all things, that's, so it's gotta be an, an enticement. Well, let's see if you guys can answer this question, okay? When you're building your themes for your uh, for your music, your scores, did you leave something over in, in case another season or a similar thing would be built upon later? Or were you advised to? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, well, I think you know. I mean, we have a Titan theme, which yeah. The so if the Titan were to go on to do more, it will be a no-brainer to carry that forward. <laughs> I mean, that's something right. that that theme was very much sort of built to have legs so yeah uh you know i think that that there's more just like any star trek theme that. that goes through you know <laughs> you know that's pieces. that were, were, that's were, were, certainly something were you advised to make sure it had legs just in case <laughs> uh, or i don't think from quite that standpoint but not a million miles away from it i mean very much terry's sort of initial thing that we sat down and he, you know that theme to be honest he he was in the, the room the entire time and it's something I think a lot of composers will probably think I'd lost my mind. Uh, and, but now, I mean, Freddie can co co sort of attest to Terry's a little different to any other yeah. director. I mean, I know, I, would I allow any other director to sit in the back of the room whilst I wrote? Probably not. Uh, it would probably be a terrible idea. They probably wouldn't want to. Um, but but literally we sat for an afternoon as I literally, because I that was a theme where I got the first half of it. I kind of knew the first bit. 
but I couldn't. I was trying to find how to make it pay off in a satisfying way. So he literally sat at the back of the room while I probably played around it a thousand times, going like, what about this? What about that? What about this? And every time he'd be like, oh, that's that's cool. No, but but go up, go up, go up, keep, 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 keep. you know, it was that sort of, you know, kind of, uh, and, and so I, you know, I, I only semi-jokingly say that we kind of wrote that theme together because, I mean, he, and the funniest thing, even at the recording session when we actually recorded it, uh, where it goes, kind of, the end of the tune kind of goes down, it goes, ba da 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 Da, 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 da. And, and I originally just had it repeat twice and he's like and then the he he you know literally he gets on the talk back he's like yeah 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 make the trumpets go up the octave on that last phrase so they repeat doesn't repeat exactly the same same way this at the same time and it was one of those things where I was like really and he's like the trumpet player's like yeah I can do that yeah it's fine and we so we, we did it and it was great and it was like so so yeah I mean that in the truest sense of the word we basically did together mm. um and so 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 yeah and I think there's uh there's there's longevity that built into it i hope um and uh we'll see if uh, it's allowed to come to some some fruition in some guys but you'll have to see 10 to really to really know what we're not what we're getting at there so when, when cause once again we're using some pieces from you said nostalgic pieces from next generation series you have some first contact when you're thinking about incorporating this music okay because obviously sometimes a certain piece can kind of carry away and become its own thing do you, did you start with the piece and figure out how to incorporate the nostalgia aspects or did you start with those aspects and then build new music around it? Well, um, you know, that, that big ending of episode nine that aired last week where they go on the enterprise, yeah. that was a six minute piece, which navigates through a whole bunch of different goldsmith themes in, packed up in between original music that I, that I wrote. So again, I think this, it, Terry had very specific, specific ideas on where to place the themes and which theme in particular, and even as detailed as what instrument it should be. And so having that roadmap um, enables you to really focus on how to make it great from that point mm -hmm. on, because you know exactly what you have to do, where you have to do it. And then you can really focus on how do you make the best possible arrangement of this going in and out of whatever your original stuff you have going on, where it gets big, where it starts to pulse or where there's some you know kind of motion happening some drive to get us out of the episode. Um, yeah, I think I think having having it given so in such great detail, it opens you up to creative um, to creativity in terms of how to make it the best possible piece of music that's cohesive, that mm -hmm. doesn't feel like you're just kind of plugging in themes at random places because they have to be there, but really segueing into them in the most smooth way possible. And yeah, that's, and, and that's that's basically it and you know once you put all these components together then you end up with music that goes in and out of old stuff into new stuff back into old stuff and it, it just kind of works i think a lot of it also goes back to to this idea of ethos where we weren't sort of necessarily just sort of looking like where we can you know needle drop themes but sort of like firstly looking back and saying like, well, what, what is this theme even mean? Um, and what's really interesting is that there's a lot of the time, I think when people look at Jerry Goldsmith stuff and they say like, oh, that's the theme from this, or that's the theme from that. But actually he didn't really see themes that way. So for example, I mean, the best, the best example of that is from uh, is the busy man motif from Star Trek five that he is, uh, oh no, Star Trek um, three, sorry. No, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm like having a mental block, but it's anyway, which is, which, which, it's late in the evening here so uh but that motif is something that then came back very much to represent it was very much attached to data and so and this is the great thing we can actually really talk about this now which is that the 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 that has been woven through it's the very first thing you hear actually it's the very first thing in the in the you know the, the, on the on the title card in the 21st century is that is a french solo french horn playing that which was very much keying us back into sort of the, the wide angle lens version of that theme, which is very much the way Jerry Goldsmith seemed, thought of themes. He was looking for motifs. He wasn't necessarily attaching them religiously to something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can even look back to the main, you know, ba -ba -da -ba, ba -da -ba, that that theme really came to re came to represent the enterprise and and, and the, the crew and so that's where actually where we with the idea of the titan theme came in because we were very much like okay like that 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 was something that was a sort of an evolution over time uh, you know it was very much started out as the movie theme and then it came to be like actually no that's the enterprise and crew and the family and that's 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 that's, that's, that's that part of the equation mm. And obviously with next gen and i grew up on next gen so next gen for me it was like the next generation theme and then i went backwards and was like oh i get it now 
because I'd certainly seen more, much more Next Gen before I ever watched the movies. Um, just because I watched Next Gen when I was like six or something, so you know that they would they would have been you know started watching. So, uh, and so that I think it was that sort of like that wide angle lens look, look, step back and look. And so and so then when you get to things like that, and you know, I mean, even looking through which bits of themes to use, and sometimes, for example, when we got to the shot of the Defiant, and we knew we wanted to use a bit of Deep Space Nine, I tried every single piece of the Deep Space Nine theme because Deep Space Nine theme is long as well. So right. it was like which one lands but doesn't feel like we're you know going too much with it, but which one gives you the most satisfying because we could only use seven notes, but eight notes of it in that point before we had to segue you know to the Enterprise A mm. uh, and the, the the Alexander Courage theme and then get weave back through you know into into Voyager. Um, and think then also you have to look at things like how you present the theme because it isn't just a matter of playing it it's a, a matter of like presentation and sort of like what's uh, and so Voyager was a really good example where what I wanted to do with Voyager was to say you know the bits I liked in Voyager were actually often when you the most emotional moments the music got very thin it sort of was quite full on and then it would cut out and you'd end up with just one line or two lines and the simplest very simple it was sort of the opposite of a lot of the sort of uh, earlier stuff it was very sort of almost like the flipping the coin and sort of being big by being small and so we wanted we knew on the the moment where seven she hesitates for a second hesitates just for a moment you and you kind of know what she's about to bring up on the view screen you know you know that this she's hesitated because it's she's you know she's about to see voyager again and so like working with the timing of exactly where to land that theme mm -hmm. such that it's its most satisfying payoff um in terms of you know and i tried it right when she pressed it when it came up you know when the, exactly when it first shot of it and then i tried putting it on her reaction to seeing it or you know or even on jack's reaction to seeing it and sort of saying saying like you know or pre-lapping it and saying like what happens if you hear voyager before she even presses the button <laughs> it's little stuff like that um but the actual overall map of this is something that terry had 1000 percent in his mind so so that side of it allowed you to to kind of get into the real nuts and bolts of like how can we really make this the most emotionally powerful thing that we can that we can make out of this moment without um you know without you know without worrying about should we be playing the voyager theme tune on voyager it's like that's we already knew that that was in the script down to you know literally every all of those beats are in the script so I think one of the cool moment in it as well is that um, the data lore scene where the violin starts playing in the background, that's a, such a beautiful touch. So can you kind of go into a little bit of how that came about, how that inclusion um, addition added? And do all the characters have a little piece of music that is subtle that if, if, we, if we heard it, we would know that's why it connects to that character? Well, I mean, that's actually the biggest. I mean, Freddie probably has the one that's like the most uh kind of loaded because it was literally the one that where we debated back and forth about releasing the soundtrack because of it being in there which is the borg <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. because we're like literally is this a spoiler just in musical form we're like that's and i mean we literally and i would like go online and be reading through the messages like i'm reading through reddit going has anyone figured this out because there are so many clues yeah. um like i mean there are so many clues um so 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 yeah so that one i think that that i mean for, you, you should speak to that one probably that's, yeah that's... well i think you're talking about the synthy thing right uh-huh yeah which is i think if it's at the top of nine isn't it yeah is how oh, at nine opens yeah i mean that's the episode we reveal everything anyway so it's kind of nice but i <laughs> I, I, so I saw some tweets of some people saying like i knew exactly what was going to happen just listening to the very first piece of music and i was like okay, <laughs> yeah. so he got it because that was a, it was the, the the jerry goldsmith borg theme which is a very strange one at that it's just kind of a synthy dun, 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 dun. Mm. it's like a chime type of church belly type sound but it's synthy um and we i, I spent a enormous amount of time trying to recreate that sonically to kind of match what he did and went through god knows how many synths and <laughs> tweaks to get that sound it was way more complicated than a big orchestral action cue it seemed to find that sound <laughs> or to make it but yeah i'm glad people picked up on it once it was in there it was a subtle the, hint the, but yeah the tricky part there was then we had sequences like you know you know like the first time when jack is attacked by the changeling and before the changeling places the bomb uh earlier in the season and uh you know there's 
uh, there's very much a, a, a thing in that sequence where you first see the red vines and you see everything, you know, the yeah. kind of something, which is calling back to something that was on the first contact um, uh, poster. There's like little oh, vine, yeah. red vines on the post on the on the text. I mean, it's, it's so the, the depth that this has gone to. Like they, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a writers' room who know their Star Trek back yeah. to front mm. and literally like yeah. on a on a and then not only know it but then went back and looked at every single thing and was like so so the depth of it and the, the depth of someone you know I mean my one of my favorite ones is that you know I thought people would get quite quickly the um the uh the fact that the the changelings with the um the transporter room and the first time Jack when Jack is trying to escape off the ship in um in episode two is that you see the guy who you do then later find out is the is one of the is the change one of the changelings on the ship, but he's the transporter guy. <laughs> and you're like, oh, he was like, oh, I, did, I thought they would sort of, you know, people might figure figure out how that 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 worked from that. Oh. And so there's there's layers and layers and layers of clues. And I'm actually I think the thing I'm gonna enjoy most is reading people like going back through it and being like, oh <laughs> you know, I mean, and even down to the Enterprise D, I mean, the very first shot after the very first act thing is pretty much the sh end shot of episode nine. It's literally the shot of it, like, like in the painting, is virtually the same exact angle as the shot, last shot of episode nine before it yeah. goes to warp. It was all there. <laughs> but, but you know, I think that's part of the fun. And, you know, that's what's fun about Terry Metalis kind of stuff is, like, it's he loves writing in layers of depth and and lots of things are good, fun callbacks as well. So, you know, there's, you know, it's in Hangar Bay 12 because of 12 Monkeys. It's like, you know, there's lots of little, there's lots of little things in there that, that are just sort of fun fun sort of you know play playful things but it's all done from a sort of oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> good old london for you uh it's all it's all done out of an enormous sort of amount of love for it and you know i think that's the that's that's the thing is if it, if it comes from that place and it's one of those things where it's done with huge reverence and you know and even the funniest one was for me as well they also you know where there was the planet called metallus prime you know, it's not Terry at all. That was something that the the Enterprise writers came up to as the as the as the shittiest place in the galaxy. <laughs> it was meant to be. It was meant to be a dig at him. It wasn't a complimentary <laughs> thing. And the this writers room put it in again. So it's like you know, I saw people going like, "Oh, he's named a planet after himself." I'm like, "No, he didn't. <laughs> he actually didn't at all. It was something that was put in. I know, sort of not you know entirely his objections, but I think it was just you know, it was it was done with a, a sort of de degree of reverence for the source material." That, that's uh that's actually quite fun so mm. and, and and like i said I, and i think what, what one reason i, I did uh, going back to a little bit to the, to the data violin thing is that it does mean so much to let's we'll say the fans recognize it and yes. it connect to when you know when he talks about giving himself over to lore it's it, like i said the, the, the symbolism of giving over that music how that music playing like that and yes. over the scene especially when he is taking charge supposedly but you still get that sense of that music I yes, mean, it's kind of interesting how the music itself was telling the story. Yes, and actually, the funny enough, that's called back from there's an episode in episode six, and um, uh, uh, in, in within when they're in Daystrom, uh, there's there's the um there's the violin is the this the security alarm sounds which play the pop goes the weasel and give it that is is the is violin it's like it's 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 meant to, meant to sort of call back to that and so you know and th those couple of those things were sort of you know. I mean that that big credit really has also to go to the editor on like I mean all of the pieces of like source music are chosen with meticulous levels of like kind of like as to what they are and they mm -hmm. often you know the first the piece of um opera you know when Worf is um you know is is in in episode uh beginning of episode four isn't it oh no or three I can't remember off the top of my head it is late night but but that's that's also a callback to 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 earlier stuff that's used and and there's a the piece that seven of nine seven is listening to in her quarters when she's been reassigned to quarters i mean that's that's actually also a 12 monkeys reference but is then a very specific you know piece of mozart that we've used as a calling sign a few times and i think that made an appearance in uh one of the movies as well so it's yeah it's it's layers of depth in there but a lot of that's with drew nichols the editor who's like yeah. you know equally equally enjoys going through and sort of putting in these things in and and uh and and, and kind of looking back at the stuff so yeah I think as one of the fans of the soundtrack, we were all so, I mean, once again, we understand, but we were a little perturbed. It took so long to get the soundtrack. So when can we finally get our hands on the soundtrack? I think it's 
20th, two days? I think it's in two days. But yeah, two days. days. April I'm 20th actually gonna is when it's verify online. Verify that because I'm I'm gonna live live verify that whilst uh, whilst whilst like uh, Freddy Freddy stall stall things. I'm gonna check. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I think I, I, I saw want to be absolutely the, accurate. The Season pre-order three. said uh, April 20th available. 20th. So I, I should be, it should be on there. Uh, Thursday. Yes. Yeah. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. That glorious, is glorious two hours. The twenties, <laughs> yeah. Uh, hours. What is it, now, what, what, t- what time it's available? I don't know whether it'll be available before the show or before. <laughs> anyway, the day and day and date was yeah. Well, that's what we eventually picked because we were just like we discussed doing it episode nine. I mean, originally it was one of those things where we wanted to put it out before the season, and it just it was that that story spoilers versus versus mm. the idea that nice i mean terry was very much sort of someone who was like he he saw he listened to the soundtrack of a couple of the movies before he saw the movie and so that's the he was like oh it's like that nice sort of overture kind of idea but but yeah it was like it, it was just that discussion of is story more sacrosanct uh than that and actually eventually i think we weighed it up and we were like yeah it is um so and and a couple and the particularly the 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 uh the borg theme i think that was the one that we would because we spent so long misdirecting <laughs> that, that that it would have slightly spoiled it so yeah yeah so what's next for you and when are you guys going to do star trek legacy <laughs> the, the oh. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to well, you you go first on that one <laughs> uh, yeah in terms of star trek we'll we'll do it if if and when they call i would say um next to me is dragon prince season five six and seven for netflix and also big nate for paramount we're doing three seasons for that too so oh wow very cool Fall an animation for the next couple of weeks months years <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh what do i have? i have um i have star wars the other the other the other, the other franchise that's the other star star wars jedi survivors coming out on the 28th i think um, which I've done, uh, you know, reunited with Gordy Hub to do that, uh, which is an insane sort of eight eight hour score. I think it's like four hours on the album, and the the game's crazy cool. Uh, so that's that's on the twenty eighth, and then I have, I have um, the next season of Apex Legends. I have a whole, whole other year of Apex Legends with a, a foot, um, and then I'm doing. I've got about four other game projects that I have. I know I've got a really fantastic um, Korean game called The First Descendant coming out later this year oh, as well. Nice. So. That, that one's really fun so so it's, i'm sort of back into video game land um uh, with lots of discussions of other things um there's a couple there's certainly one film and a couple of tv series that i'm looking at as well but but um and to star trek well yeah i mean it's uh I, I partic- particularly particularly <coughs> excuse me once i think everyone's seen episode 10 i think that'll it, it all will become clear yeah. <laughs> we have to yeah. put the good vibes out there then it will happen well, Mr. Barr, Mr. Reedman, it was an absolute pleasure to talk with you both. And when you guys are ready to talk more uh, TV shows,